I invite all of you to take a Bible. Let's turn together to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25. On the last Sunday of the month, we try to carve out time at the end of the service uh, for unhurried time in prayer, seeking the Lord in prayer. And we're going to do that today. I just wanted to give you a heads up. And uh, also at the end of the service, I also want to give you another heads up. I've got envelopes full of money. And I want to give them all out today. These are uh, envelopes full of $20 bills. And I did this a year ago. And uh, anybody who wants to take a $20 bill, and there's instructions in the envelope, and with creativity, you take that money and you reproduce it. Um, Do a bake sale, start a technology company, I don't care what you want to do. But on December 14, we were going to have another special offer, and we had this one today for our Christmas and October missionaries, but on December 14, we have our annual Jesus birthday offering. Now, I know students, you'll be gone by then, I think, but you can, you, students can get in on this, and you can turn it in uh, before you leave at, at the end of finals week. But anyway, I just wanted to give you a heads up. We're going to do that at the end of the service, so I'll put it there. I just want to make sure no one takes that. Wow, what a great time of year. I raked leaves all day Friday, and the lawn was spotless. <laughs> and then I got up the next morning, and it was like I'd never done anything. Does anybody have your life work that way? Preaching is like that sometimes. <laughs> you know, I think I got everything cleaned up, and the next week it's a mess again. Not you, me. I'm talking about me. Our whole uh, theme this month has been on serving. This month of October, serving in the way of Jesus. And I put these three circles, uh, I don't have them on here, but our our three investments, worship, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and connect, love one another, and serve, love your neighbor as yourself. And those three circles can never be detached from each other. Our serve can never be detached from our affinity with Christ and our community. And so we serve in the way of Jesus, which means that it's in the context, the unique context of the church. We're not like any service agency. And I want to take this story, which I preached on a year ago exactly today. It's it's actually the lectionary reading for three weeks from now, but I want to do it today because it fits this theme and it fits the envelopes I'm going to give out later. And it's the second of three stories that Jesus told when he spoke about the end times about how he was going to come and what would happen when he returns. And the first story was about 10 brides who were waiting for the bridegroom. And who's the bridegroom? Jesus. The answer is always Jesus. And uh, the third story is a story of sheep and goats who will be divided at the end times and they'll face the king. And who's the king? This middle story is about a man who went and left town and left three servants with all his wealth. And here's how it reads, beginning with verse 14. Now, again, he said, Jesus said, it will be like a man going on a journey. He called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I've gained five more. The master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents came and said, master, uh, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I've gained two more. And the master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. Servant, you have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you've not sown and gathering where you've not scattered seed. So I was afraid and I went out and I hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. 
So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown, and I gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money in deposit with the bankers, so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten. For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You want to pray a courageous prayer with me right now? Lord, this is your time. And I want to offer myself completely to you right now. You say to me what you will. Put me to what you will. Do with me what you will. I am yours. I am your servant. And I offer this hour as my gift of worship to you. Amen. Amen. So the man is Jesus, and he gave out this money, and he went away for a long time. And obviously it parallels what Christ did. He came, and he ministered, and he died on the cross, and he rose from the dead, and then he ascended to the Father's side, and he entrusted the entire kingdom endeavor to 11 guys. And Jesus went away for a long time. That's the Bible story, and we're still waiting for him to come back, right? He's still been gone a long time, but look at how that endeavor has grown. Uh, the Christian gospel has spread around the world and continues to spread at breakneck speed. And uh, he gave these guys talents, and some tr uh, translations say a bag of gold, but here's what it is. The talent was a... Uh, it was a currency based on weight, and it, it took different forms in different cultures. But in uh, Jesus' day in Palestine, it, uh, it averaged about this, 20 years' wages for a common day laborer. Now, you take minimum wage, $7 and plus uh, an hour. I, I just rounded up to 10 bucks an hour, common day labor, 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year, 20 years, and it comes to about a half million bucks, Right? Now, if you do your math, he gives to one guy five of those talents. So somebody, mathematician, tell us, how much is it? $2.5 million. To another guy, he gives two talents, which comes up to what? One million bucks. And the third guy, he gives a measly $500,000. And then he takes off. And uh, the one servant, um, it says they went right away. He put it right to work, which is a wonderful picture of obedience. And uh, the guy with five did that, the guy with two did that, and the guy with one went and dug, it, dug a hole and put the money in there. So the talent isn't just money, but in the, in our, uh, for our purposes, it means this. The talent represents the sum total of all the time, your health, your wealth, and your circumstances, all that that's been allotted to each one of us. Are you with me so far? And sometimes we say this prayer at our offering time, all that I am, that's the part of me that you can't change. I'm 57 years old, I got flat feet, and uh, my hair is gray, and I'm not very good at math. All right, that's the part of me that I can't change. I looked at Bonnie, she said, yeah, you're not very good at math. She's our accountant, praise God for Bonnie. But anyway, that's all that I am, the part of me that I can't change. All that I possess, that's my stuff, and then all that I can do. That's the abilities that God has given to me. It's all a gift from God. Given to accomplish whose purposes? His purposes in the world through me. How many of you believe that? How many of you are like me that on good days you get it but on other days you don't? Yeah, we're all that way. And I always say that the day that I fully get that is the day I'll be fully free. God has entrusted to us more than talent. He's entrusted to us all that we are, all that we possess, all that we can do. Now, but not only that, I would add this. He has also entrusted to us the knowledge of him, his revealed word. Isn't that amazing? We have it. There is a God out there who loves us enough that he wants us to know him, and he's left no stone unturned that we could find him, and he pours out his own Holy Spirit that we can walk with him. In other words, when the scripture, the story, the talent, it is everything. And you look at all that and you say, oh my goodness, the story calls that you've been faithful with a few things, but we need to be honest with ourselves. That is huge. In fact, 
there is, that is of immeasurable value, what God has entrusted to every one of us in this room. And I love the words of, you got to quote Emily Dickinson, don't you? Every sermon. Look at this, a wonderful, lovely poem. She says, as if I asked a common alms, which is just a handout, as if I asked for a handout, but in my wondering hand, a stranger pressed a kingdom and I bewildered stand. God has entrusted to every one of us the world. Did you get up this morning with that in mind? And, and the master entrusted it to those three servants and then he went away for a long time. And then he came back, which in the story refers to when Christ is going to come back. He is going to come back. Do you believe that? Uh, the Bible says he is, and he's going to bring human history to an end. And as Roman 15 says, that we will all give an account to him. We will all give an account to what has been entrusted to us. And the guy came back with five, who had been given five. He laid another five at the master's feet. He said, here it is. And the master said, well done, good and faithful servant. And I love what he says. He gives two rewards. He says, you've been faithful in a few things. And he gives two uh, Two rewards. The first one is this. I am now going to uh, entrust to you many things. My goodness, what more do we need from that list I just gave you? What he's talking about is a coming kingdom. Because we are faithful in a few things in this world, God is going to entrust to us even more significant things in his coming kingdom. Now, that's, I don't know what that might be. But heaven is not going to be us sitting around playing a uh, rummy cube. Heaven is going to be us being part of a great... Um, a great enterprise. And the second reward was this. Come and share in your master's, what's the word? Happiness. How much happiness might that be? And the guy with the two talents, same thing. Same response, same reward. Then the guy with the one talent comes and he said a very interesting thing. He took the one talent and he said, well, here's the one that you gave me. I put it in a hole and I dug it up and here it is. And uh, he said two very interesting things to the master. He said, first of all, I know that you are a hard man. And secondly, I know that you um, reap where you haven't sown and you harvest where you haven't planted. Now, that tells me one thing about this third servant. He really didn't know the master. He didn't know the God of grace as the God of grace. He knew him as a hard taskmaster. And he also didn't know that God owned everything and God never reaps where he has not already sown. Everything is rightfully his. He didn't steal anything. So this third servant doesn't really know the master. In other words, the first two servants were like uh, they had the faith of a son. The third servant had the faith of a slave. And the reason we know that is then his third thing that he said was this, I was what? I was afraid. And so I hid what you had trusted to me. Isn't that interesting? Fear is what causes people to bury their life in a hole. Fear is the uh, flip side of unbelief. And in fear, this uh, servant did uh, what he only knew to do and he returned the thing in its original condition, back to the master. Now, you and I would think immediately this. We'd think, well, what's wrong with that? He didn't steal anything. He didn't squander anything. He returned the original talent. But look at the master's response. You, what's the, what's the language in your Bible? You wicked, lazy servant. Now, I know what this guy was probably thinking. He's probably thinking making the same mistake that you and I might make. I didn't steal anything. I didn't squander anything. I didn't hurt anybody. In fact, you can almost hear the monologue go on and on. I, I am moral. I take care of my family. Uh, and I'm a Christian. I, I go to church, whatever you want to add. You can almost hear the guy saying that. But one thing he failed to do, he failed to recognize the amazing trust that God had given him and he failed to put it to use in the allotment, the time allotment that he had. And the response of the master seems awfully harsh, doesn't it? 
you wicked, lazy servant. It makes me wonder, it makes me shudder to think how many people are today, maybe in this room, living under the illusion, I'm not hurting anybody, I'm not stealing from anybody, I live a moral life. But the shock of hearing the master's words And the master said, take the one one that the guy had and give it to the guy that has 10. For to whom much is given, you know, much will be added. And he who has little, what little he has will be taken away. And then he said a, a very final, very sobering thing. Take that servant and throw him into the darkness. And what's the darkness? The darkness is simply an eternal condition forever separated from the light of Christ. And you fill in the words. You can fill in the blank. Where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. It is, it is one of the harshest stories in the New Testament. And people might say, well, the God that I believe in would never do that. Well, the God that you believe in doesn't make any, uh, any um, difference. It's the God who is. And the God who is is the God who commands. And you and I have to pay attention to what he commands. It's a story about consecration is really what it's all about. And E.M. Bound says, consecration is the devoting of all we have to God for his own specific use. It's a separation from things questionable, but even a separation from things legitimate when the choice is to be made between the things of this life and the claims of God. In other words, a consecrated life is very different from, from just a life of service. Now we're gonna do servolution in, in starting in a week. And a lot of good's gonna be done. We have a lot of agencies that we partner with and we're hoping for four to 500 of you, either with your family or on your own or with a Sunday school class or a small group or a dorm floor that you could sign up for one of those things. And, that's, and a lot of good's gonna be done, but I wanna tell you something. As wonderful as that is, consecration is something much deeper. It's a life posture where I recognize that nothing belongs to me and I give my entire life and energy to serve the purposes of him who called me. Consecrated life is characterized by five things, real quick. It's first characterized by gratitude. After all, to think that God himself, the creator of the universe, would entrust a piece of his kingdom to me, doesn't that make you grateful? What a privilege. What a privilege. That God would entrust his kingdom work to me or to you. Here's the second thing. It's a constant attentiveness and obedience Consecrated life is a life that keeps your ear to the ground and you're always available and responsive to how the Holy Spirit leads you. It's not a once in a lifetime decision. It's not me, Pastor Mark, saying, okay, you over there, you do this, and you over there, you do this. It's, it's a unique set of circumstances, a unique calling that God has on each one in this room. And in order to do that, you have to have a constant attentiveness to his word and to his presence, to his voice. You understand what I'm saying? And how do you do that? Well, you can't do that without a saturation in his word. How can you know his heart and his mind if you don't know his word? Show me a person who doesn't spend time in the word of God and there's a person who will never know a consecrated life. And along with that is a life of prayer. I know his heart and his mind through the word. I know his voice through prayer. A consecrated life is a prayerful life. Ian Bound says, prayerlessness can never walk with consecration. The two are, are exactly opposite. But here's the third thing. A consecrated life is characterized by sorrow and joy. Sorrow because there's no place you and I can take the place between the hope of heaven and a hurting world without experiencing sorrow. Some of you are play, you're in that position even in your own household, maybe between you and an unbelieving spouse or an unbelieving child. Or in your workplace, you stand between the hope of heaven and a bunch of people who don't give a lick about Christ and you see them suffer. There's sorrow there. But there's also incredible joy to live a life free of responsiveness to God's call in your life. And Jesus says, sharing your master's joy and happiness, meaning the end result will always be joy. The consecrated life is characterized by all those things. In other words, I'm just hurrying through this to say this. This step of consecration is the, absolutely the greatest leap 
in the life of any believer, anybody in this room. It is the narrow way that Jesus talked about. He said, wide is the gate that leads to destruction, but narrow is the way that leads to life. And I'd go as far as to say that our Lord Jesus gave no uh, provision for any kind of a Christian life outside of a fully consecrated life. His invitation to them at the time and to us today is follow me. If anyone wants to claim my name, you must deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. He's calling us all to a consecrated life. So I, I, as we transition to prayer this morning, here's this question. I gave you a Reader's Digest uh, version of a sermon on this text. This is the most important question any one of you are going to find if, uh, face in your entire life. It's the most important question I'm going to face in my lifetime. Who is this story meant for? Is there anybody in this room that's too young to hear Christ's invitation and command? Is there anybody here that's too old? Can students, junior high, high school students, just blow this off? I'll get to this later. Can you do that? Is there anybody here that's too rich for this or too poor? Is there anybody here that's too educated, too sophisticated for this, or are they, is anybody here too uneducated? The claims of the Creator on each one of us this morning is profound. And to each one in this room, He's entrusted to us a unique set of circumstances, a unique space of time, a unique set of abilities, a unique sphere of influence that is unique and is unlike anybody else in this room. Do you believe that? Every one of you. How many of you believe that? I'm just checking to see if there's a pulse here this morning. Um, who is this story meant for? It's meant for me. This week I just spent time immersed in this story and I, I came away yesterday morning. I just put my pencil down and, my, and I just said, oh my goodness, this is for me. And a consecrated life is not a life where I decide back 20 years ago, oh, I'm going to live a consecrated life. It's a question I face every morning. When I take time and I get quite enough long enough to realize all that God has done for me, then the natural response is, oh, Lord, how can I serve you today? How can I offer today to you? The prayer of consecration is a prayer you offer every day. And I, in the morning I say, Lord, I don't know what's going to come across my desk or what's going to come through my door or what are you going to drop on my lap. All I want to know is this, Lord, help me to be attentive and help me to be responsive and help me to be faithful to accomplish all that you want me to accomplish today, no more and no less. That's as true for me, a preacher, as it is for you, whether you're a school teacher, a shopkeeper, or a student, or a retired, or a stay-at-home mom, the, the prayer is the same. Isn't it interesting that there's a great democracy about the commands of Christ? It all comes out differently because the Holy Spirit works through us individually, but the command is the same. The story's meant for me. My question is, is the story meant for you today?